We start with a point. Hi, everybody. Nice to have you back with me once again. My name is Rob Bryanton, and the Imagining the Tenth Dimension video blog today's entry is called The Quantum Observer. When Hugh Everett III first came up with his Many Worlds interpretation in 1957, he made an important distinction. When we observe one outcome or another, we're not really collapsing the quantum wave function, we are merely observing it in a particular state. The other potential states continue to exist, just as real as the one we're observing. Whether we call it observing or collapsing doesn't change what we see, but it can change the implications of whether there are actually other equally real parallel universe versions of our reality, or whether those parallel universes are just an imaginary outcome of a thought experiment. Everett's thesis, despite support from John Wheeler, one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century, was met with indifference and in some cases derision from the physics community. So, instead of becoming a physicist upon his graduation, Everett took a job as a defense analyst with the Pentagon. Hugh Everett III has been credited with developing the infamous Cold War policy of mutual assured destruction, the idea that if every nuclear power has enough atomic bombs to destroy the world, then no one should be tempted to start a war. Isn't it interesting to think about this policy, abbreviated appropriately enough as MAD, in the context of the Many Worlds interpretation? I've just come across a new book I'm going to order, pictured here, which is about this man's life. The Many Worlds of Hugh Everett III, Multiple Universes, Mutual Assured Destruction, and the Meltdown of a Nuclear Family. So, if each of us is observing the wave function of the universe in a particular state, we are each a unique quantum observer. Should that make each of us feel isolated or connected? Kevin Gurabrand called this the quantum isolation problem. With my 2011 entries, I've been showing a way of thinking about how our quantum world is connected to the fourth dimension and our duration is in the fifth, but how really both are interchangeable. This means that which label you assign to any particular spatial dimension depends upon your frame of reference established by the previous ones. Last time, in Timelike Entanglement, I quoted a paragraph from my book and mentioned that the next paragraph was about the quantum observer, a topic that comes up a number of times with this project. Here's that paragraph now. A particular meme set, when it's attached to a physical body, is the quantum observer for that person, collapsing the wave of possibilities along the arrow of time and experiencing life as we know it. However, since that set of memes can also be thought of as existing completely separately from a physical body, there are many other ramifications to this. Some of those ramifications get quite metaphysical. But this time, let's look at some new articles that have come out recently to show how the quantum world connects to the fourth dimension, birds as quantum observers, and life as a subset of a quantum wave function. I'm going to give you a link here to a paper published at Cornell University Libraries, archive.org, demonstrating the math behind quantum mechanics in four dimensions. Then, here's a link to an article at New Scientist magazine, Quantum States Last Longer in Birds' Eyes. It reveals that birds are able to maintain electrons in an entangled state longer at the back of their eyes than any scientist working in a lab under carefully controlled conditions has been able to do so far. The birds, it appears, are able to use the information gleaned from these entangled electrons to aid in their navigation abilities. Finally, here's a link to an article Michael Brooks published. It's a wonderful summation of the many interpretations of what it means to be a quantum observer. Uh, this is from New Scientist, and the article is called Quantum Reality, The Many Meanings of Life. If you go to the text version of this blog, you'll see I quote quite a few paragraphs from this extensive article, and I'm not going to quote as much here in the video version. But I do want to say that one of the reasons I like this article so much is because it points to a claim I've been making since my project began, that the many worlds interpretation is seeing increasing acceptance from mainstream science. And here's a part of what the article says about that. If the process of measurement by a classical observer is fundamental to creating the reality we observe, what performed the observations that brought the contents of the universe into existence? 
you really need to have an observer outside the system to make sense. But there's nothing outside the universe by definition, says Harvey Brown, a philosopher of science at the University of Oxford. That's why, Brown says, cosmologists now tend to be more sympathetic to an interpretation created in the late 1950s by Princeton University physicist Hugh Everett. His many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics says that reality is not bound to a concept of measurement. Instead, the myriad different possibilities inherent in a quantum system each manifest in their own universe. David Deutsch, a physicist at the University of Oxford and the person who drew up the blueprint for the first quantum computer, says he can now only think of the computer's operation in terms of these multiple universes. To him, no other interpretation makes sense. He and Brown both claim that many worlds is already gaining traction among cosmologists. Arguments from string theory, cosmology, and observational astronomy have led some cosmologists to suggest we live in one of many universes. Last year, Anthony Aguirre of the University of California, Santa Cruz, Max Tegmark of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and David Laser of Harvard University laid out a scheme that ties together ideas from cosmology and many worlds. I know it might seem like I've quoted a lot here, but there's still much more to the full article, and I invite you to follow the link here and uh, do please read the whole thing. So, if we're each moving through a probability space of possible universes, are we causing reality to occur? Or is reality simply happening to us as we helplessly observe one outcome after another? We'll return to this ongoing discussion of how much control do we really have as we navigate through the information that becomes reality with an entry called changing your brain. My name's Rob Bryanton. Enjoy the journey.